It is early in Lent, and so, as is always the case, my thought turns to taxes. It's the time to gather up all those papers and send them off to someone who's much smarter than I am, who will do my taxes perhaps without breaking as many laws as I would if I were doing it myself. That all would be no problem if all that paperwork arrived at one time on one day and so I could take it all and send it to somebody, but it doesn't. Unfortunately, it begins to trickle in after the first of the year, and it's only just finally wrapping up by the second or third week of February, it seems. All the more because there are now companies and, and brokerages and whatnot, banks, that won't actually send you any paper. They just tell you what website to go to and print it out yourself. So all of this makes me just a little paranoid. And so I have one place on one desk in my house where I put all these papers as they arrive or as I print them out so I'll know exactly where they are. As you might have guessed after five years of listening to me, I'm one of those people who always puts things back where they belong because I want to be able to find them again. And so you can imagine my surprise when I went to my stack of papers this week and began looking through them and discovered I didn't have everything I thought I was supposed to have. This created an immediate panic because this just doesn't happen to me. And I tore the house apart because I knew I had received these things. You have, you have memories of when things came in the mail. It's like those of us who can remember which side of the book we were reading, which page words were on. We can see it. I could see these things coming in the mail, but they weren't there. On the way out after 8 o'clock this morning, someone suggested I should have prayed to St. Anthony. It did occur to me to think about divine intervention because I knew I had received these things. But they weren't there. And it turned out, in fact, one of the things I thought I had received only came in the mail this week after I had torn the house apart and thoroughly come to doubt myself and my own understanding of what it is that I know. I was forced to revise what it was I thought I knew and come to some new understanding based on new information. We operate in kind of this way in our lives a lot, if you think about it. There are a lot of things that we just know. Like, you know how your car key works. You know where the brake is on your car, at least I hope you do. You know how your house key works, which side is the right side up. They're things you don't even have to think about. They're just, they, you just know them and, and they, they work for you. We do something similar in our spiritual lives, too. There are things that we just know. We learn them early on. Jesus loves me, this I know. The Lord is my shepherd. Things that are filed away in the back of our heads that are really important. As your pastor, I'm telling you these things are really important because I don't want you having to grasp for what it is you believe about God when you find yourself in an emergency. That kind of stuff should come out immediately and be there when we need it. That's good. The hazard is that we can come to accumulate so much of that stuff over time that we begin to believe we know it all. We believe, come to believe we have God figured out. And it's on occasions like that when once in a while God has to remind us that no, we don't have God entirely figured out. That is where St. Peter finds himself in the Gospel story this morning. We need to know the, the, the back story, the, the beginning of this story. Jesus has collected his followers. He's done some literally miraculous things in their presence, but he hasn't yet really explained to them who he is and what that is going to mean for him and for them. So he's going to broach the subject gently. He's walking along with his followers and he asks them, who do people say that I am? And who, who are they saying that I am? Is this thing we've started, it's gotten some buzz, what's the word out there? And Peter, being the one who always speaks for everybody else, gives the standard answers. You're Elijah, you're one of the prophets. All these things that we know are supposed to happen because we've read the Torah and the prophets. We know what God is going to do. But then Jesus makes it a little more complicated. He says, okay, well, who do you say that I am? That is a question, dear friends, that every one of us should be asking constantly in our spiritual lives. Who do we say, who do I say that Jesus is? And how am I living that in my life? 
for now, we can concentrate on what Peter says. He says, you're the Messiah. And it seems Jesus is a little surprised by this, that Peter has gotten it immediately without having been prompted too much. So he commends Peter for this. He says, well done, you, you, I'll build my church on you. Presumably on, on those who have this particular understanding of who Jesus is. But it's only a couple of minutes later when Peter gets himself into trouble. Presumably, he's feeling pretty good. I, I got it. I, I, I know. I, I have the answer now. This is going to work for me. But when Jesus begins to tell his followers what it means to be the Messiah, to be him and to be them as followers of the Messiah, Peter says, oh, no, 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 that, that, that's not the way it works. I, I know because I've read up already, and I got the right answer the last time, so obviously I'm going to get the right answer this time. No, that can't be you. And Jesus has to, to put it gently, help Peter readjust his perspective. Get behind me, Satan is a fairly strong way of putting it, but that's essentially what he's doing. He's helping Peter to see that he thought he knew everything, but he didn't really. And if that's what, Peter, what Jesus is saying to Peter, dear friends, because we are standing there in the crowd also, that is what Jesus is saying to us. If we haven't already figured out that the Messiah will be humiliated, rejected, ignored, persecuted, ultimately gotten out of the way, now is when that is made plain to us. And it is in that moment that you and I also must reevaluate if that is what we thought the story was going to be. It's easy enough for us as Latter-day people because we've read to the end of the story. We know how it ends. We have a little more information than his original listeners did, but that doesn't mean that we don't still need to reevaluate what it means to be followers of that particular kind of Messiah. The rejected, humiliated, persecuted kind of Messiah. Because if that's what Jesus got, what he is saying is that's what his followers can expect also. <coughs> Do we understand that we follow God in a particular way that will be lived out in our lives, that will be lived out in the way other people react and respond to us? How often do we think about who God really is? One of the theologians who commented on this passage said that we're pretty good at talking about God in terms of attributes. God is loving, God is just, God is kind, God is merciful, God is fill in the blank. Things that God does. We're not quite as comfortable talking about who God is. To imagine somehow that God is this being who is willing to be subject to human power for the sake of human salvation. Think about that for a minute. A being, the being who created everything, who nonetheless is willing to be subject to the power of that being's creations, creatures, for the sake of saving those creatures. Is that the kind of Messiah that we imagine that we follow? One that can be so creative, can, can go so far beyond what we would imagine if we were in God's position. And then are we willing to say that if, in fact, we're going to follow that God, we are ready to have the kind of experience that Jesus did? We're in for a fairly rocky time if we do. Because he goes on then to tell us what we should expect. Taking up our cross, laying down our life. They're fairly strong ways of expressing what it's going to be like to be a member of this organization. That's particularly difficult, I think, for us as suburban Americans to imagine. <coughs> Most of us will never be persecuted for our faith or discriminated against for our faith, denied housing, denied a job, denied anything because of our faith. But I guarantee you, dear friends, there are lots of people around the world who are hearing this lesson read today who know exactly what that's like, for whom Faith is, in fact, a matter of taking up a cross, for whom faith is a matter of taking life risks. 
that doesn't completely get us off the hook just to know that those people are out there someplace because we are still sitting here today. We have still heard the words. We can't unhear them. Now we have to decide what they mean for us. Commonly, the way this has been interpreted in recent decades in, in wealthy, comfortable places like this is that to take up our cross is to look around us and see where the problems of the world are and take them up as our causes. To look for what has no voice, where there is no one advocating for something, to take that up and begin to advocate for change in the world, keep complaining until somebody does something. Maybe you can see already what the flaw is in that. Is every one of us is not somebody. If all we do is complain until somebody does something about this, nothing will ever happen because no somebody will ever step forward. So there has to be more. We have to have skin in the game. We have to be willing to take our faith out of this place and risk it. Risk being rejected, risk being persecuted, risk being laughed at, risk failing, frankly, with what we do with our faith in our lives in the world. That can be really, really hard, and that's why this lesson comes up now, I think. We can begin to think about how we might do that. I'll tell you another story about why it's so hard. I think I've told it before, but it's a good story, so I'll tell it again. When I was working full-time in science, I worked with a, a group. Uh, they actually were dentists. I said physicians at the last service. In fact, they were dentists. We did a study on what the bacterial consequences were of having your teeth cleaned. For various reasons, this is a big issue. For those who have heart problems, you may already know that. Uh, it was a very important paper because among dentists, this was a standard practice and it would change the whole way that dentists did a key part of what they do. So an important paper that was gonna go to an important medical journal. We wrote this paper up, this group, and the, the, physician, the dentist who was in charge of it was supposed to be the one who was gonna send it off to the journal. And you may not know how this works, but when you write a scientific paper, you send it to the journal, then they send it out to a bunch of other people who read it and criticize it, gently or not so gently. Uh, you make some revisions, it goes back again, back and forth until your peers feel that the article is good enough to publish, presuming that it gets to that point. So it can be a pretty brutal back and forth. Anyway, uh, this paper sat on this dentist's desk for months. He didn't send it and didn't send it and didn't send it and didn't send it. And it was really important. This is sort of the culmination of his, his career. And I couldn't figure out why he wouldn't send it. Until finally it occurred to me that as long as it sat on his desk and nobody else saw it, it was perfect. The minute he sent it off, and his colleagues began to criticize it, it could no longer be perfect. It could no longer be that nice thing that he had neatly contained in that box on his desk, exactly the way he wanted it to be, not changing, always just exactly the way it was originally. It's kind of like that with our faith. If we're not willing to take up our cross and we're not willing to lay down our life for what it is that we say we believe, we're keeping the faith on our desk. We're keeping it in that nice, perfect state. No risk of being rejected. No risk of being criticized. No risk of being laughed at for trying to do something that the world knows we can't do anyway. And yet that is what Jesus is calling us to do, to pick up our faith, the cross, and take it out into the world. Follow where Jesus leads, which is into difficult places, sad places, complicated places, controversial places. Perhaps take the risk that a little of the shine on our faith will be knocked off. Nevertheless, that is what Jesus calls us to do. So, dear friends, as we walk through these days of Lent, let us take up our faith. Not worry if it's going to get a little dirty. Not worry if our hands are going to get a little dirty in the process. Let us have at least a little skin in the game. Perhaps we'll find, discover something that we didn't know. Perhaps we'll discover something new that God intends us to see. 
in the process, participate in some small way in what it is God intends for you and for me and for all the world. Amen.